Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Franz. Um, I had not realized that we were a bit of a, a test case, a test case here today. And um, so I mean, I'm even more pleased to be here to speak with you and provide you with a, an overview of the international law that's relevant to the work of ports. Um, and so uh, at the outset, let me thank Franz and uh, the organizers for inviting us here today. Uh, we're very pleased to be here at the 20, 29th conference uh, and to give you a bit of a, an overview of, of the work that we do at the United Nations uh, in Oceans and the Law of the Sea. <clears throat> um, so what I will do here this morning is to give you uh, an overview of three different topics. Firstly, the role in the history of the United Nations for the maritime industry. Um, a, a sense uh, of the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which has been described as a constitution for the oceans. And then also to give you an overview of the institutional uh, the global institutional framework for oceans and the law of the sea. You can imagine that each one of these topics is, uh, could take up an entire day. So this is really just to give you a, a sense, a flavor of, of what, uh, what um, is this framework and the institutional framework for the work that is done in ports. <clears throat> Uh, since it was established in 1945, the United Nations has played a very important role for the maritime industry. Uh, as a point, point of reference, most of you will be familiar with the work of the International Maritime Organization. Um, it actually wasn't established until a few years after the United Nations was established. It was established in 1948. Um, at the time, there were a number of treaties that had already been adopted to provide for maritime safety and security. Uh, but uh, some of those dated back all the way to the mid-19th century. Uh, and there were a number of states at the time that had already been talking about the need for a permanent body to provide for efficiency in navigation and also to promote uh, efficiencies in navigation. Uh, but it wasn't until the United Nations was established in 1945 that the IMO came into being. There was a conference that was held under the auspices of the United Nations in 1948 in Geneva, and it led to the adoption of a convention, the IMO Convention. That convention then came into force in 1948, or 1958, pardon me, and the uh, IMO met for the first time later that year. So the U United Nations has been uh, very formative in the work that's being done in ports and the uh, work that's being done in the maritime industry in providing the legal framework for that work. There's many different organs and bodies of the United Nations uh, that are relevant to the maritime industry, and you'll, some of you will be familiar with the six main uh, organs and bodies of the, uh, of the United Nations. Particularly relevant for the work of the maritime industry is the work of the General Assembly and the Security Council, and I'll go through a little bit of uh, detail in the work that that's, that's done by those two bodies. But there are many different bodies and organizations within the UN system. This is a, a UN organizational chart to just give you a flavor of the complexity of the UN system. Uh, and many of these organizations are relevant to the work that's being done by the maritime industry. I, I, I can just uh, give you, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a sense of the work of the General Assembly and the Security Council. And I'll also highlight some of the work of the specialized agencies here, uh, particularly the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, and the ILO, the International Labor, or, Labor, or, Labor Organization. But to begin uh, with a history of the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea, which sets out the legal framework within which all activities in the oceans and seas must be carried out. The history of the Law of the Sea is really a history of the need for international rule of law in the oceans. Uh, there is, for many, many years prior to the adoption of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, there was the need for uh, addressing a number of significant issues that had arisen in relations between states, particularly avoiding claims, conflicting claims for resources in the oceans and um, areas of the oceans, ensuring freedom of navigation, establishing a regime for resources beyond areas of national jurisdiction, accommodating, accelerating, and multiple uses of the oceans, and, of course, protecting and preserving the marine environment. The first and second conferences on the law of the sea were held in 1958 and 1960. Uh, the first conference led to the adoption of a number of treaties uh, that are still in force today, um, but, it wasn't, but they weren't able to resolve a number of fundamental issues, particularly those relating to the breadth of the territorial sea and uh, issues relating to fisheries zones. That wasn't resolved until the third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, 
which was opened in 1973 and after many years of significant work led to the adoption of the convention text in 1982. This marked the culmination of more than 14 years of work involving the participation by more than 150 countries representing all regions of the world, all legal and political systems, and the spectrum of socioeconomic development. It was very important during the negotiation of the treaty, the convention, that the work that had already been done by the uh, bodies and organizations in the UN system was integrated and cons made consistent with the work of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So a number of the secretariat bodies were very, very significantly involved in the evolution and the adoption of the text of the convention to ensure that there was this consistency in the way in which the law of the sea was evolving and uh, making sure that that was consistent with the other instruments that were already uh, in force in, in, uh, in, other, in other bodies and organizations. So even before the entry of the convention, which was in 1945, there were a number of IMO treaties that had already made explicit or implicit reference to the convention and the way in which to ensure compatibility between the provisions in the convention and other IMO instruments. The convention established for the first time a single set of basic rules for the oceans and represents an unprecedented attempt by the international community to regulate all aspects of the resources of the sea and uses of the ocean. It embodied in one instrument traditional rules for the uses of oceans and at the same time introduced new legal concepts and regimes addressing new concerns, particularly regarding multiple uses of the oceans. The convention is often referred to as a constitution of the oceans as it contains the legal framework within which all activities in the oceans of the seas must be carried out. It also recognizes that all problems of the oceans are closely interrelated and must be dealt with in a cohesive and a holistic manner. And as I've mentioned, the convention is a, a framework instrument, meaning that it set a number of specific um, areas of the law, but it also allowed for the further development of areas of law of the sea, uh, particularly by other organizations, some of which I've already mentioned. The scope of the convention is quite vast if you've ever taken a look at it. So it uh, consists of 320 different provisions, nine different annexes. It truly is an attempt to, in one instrument, to provide for all areas and uses of the, of the oceans. It includes reference to uh, navigational and overflight rights, definition and limits of maritime zones, economic jurisdiction, legal status of resources on the seabed beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, passage of ships through straits, conservation and management of marine living resources, protection and preservation of the marine environment, of course, and a very unique fe feature at the time, which was a binding uh, procedure for dispute resolution between states. It also established three bodies, and here you can see an overview of the way that the convention is actually uh, divided up. Um, and as I uh, was just to mention, it also established three new bodies in the Law of the Sea, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and the International Seabed Authority. And now some of you might be familiar with this. This is the, uh, a look at the maritime zones that are established in UNCLOS. <coughs> in the convention, and um, some of you might have heard of, of these different zones. There's the, um, the territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles from the baseline, which is the low water point on the oceans. The contiguous zone, which is up to 24 nautical miles adjacent to the territorial sea. The exclusive, e the exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles, or at the greatest distance of 200 nautical miles from the baseline of the coast. And then beyond that are the areas of the high seas, which are known, really regarded as the freedoms of the high seas. And then beneath the water column is the continental shelf, the extended continental shelf, which is the work that's been done, being done by the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. And then the area beyond the extended continental shelf, which is considered to be the common heritage of mankind. And here's just to show you the, the current status of the convention. Um, it currently has 167 parties, 157 signatories, but 167 parties. And its um, uh, uh, 
packaged with two other implementing agreements, which together form the legal framework for the oceans and the law of the sea. There's the Part 11 implementation agreement, which relates to the seabed uh, resources and to the management of the seabed resources. Oh, pardon me. And it currently has 147 parties. And the second implementing agreement is the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, which currently has 82 parties. And it provides the legal framework for the conservation and management of straddling fish stocks and migratory fish stocks. So you can see that we're getting close to the point of universal participation uh, in, the, in the convention with 167 parties. As I mentioned, the international law applicable to the oceans is not just contained in the convention. Uh, the convention needs to be read in conjunction with the work that's being done by other bodies and organizations that are relevant to the oceans. And you can see here on the screen some of those areas where other work is being done. So safety of navigation, of course, the work of IMO is very relevant. Rights of workers, uh, environmental protection, the work of UNEP, the Env United Nations Environmental Protection, uh, uh, um, environmental um, uh, program, uh, energy, maritime uh, warfare, fisheries, the work of FAO, of course, is very relevant. So it's important to read the convention alongside the work that's being done by these other bodies or organizations and the uh, binding and non-binding uh, instruments that are being adopted by those organizations. So on the one hand, the convention provides for very six, a fixed permanent structure for the law of the sea, but it also has a built-in flexibility to allow for these other areas of the law of the oceans to be developed by these other bodies. So I'll turn now to um, a fairly quick overview of the, the global institutional framework for the law of the sea. <coughs> beginning with the work of the General Assembly. Um, you m will probably be familiar with the General Assembly and the work that it does. It's the main deliberative and policy-making and representative organ of the United Nations. Um, and it plays a very significant role in the process of standard setting and the codification of international law, including the law that's relevant to uh, maritime, uh, the maritime industry. Every year, the General Assembly conducts an, an annual rev review and evaluation of the convention and the implementation of the convention and other developments relating to the law of the sea. And it adopts a resolution at the end of every year, actually two resolutions. One resolution it, we call the Omnibus Resolution, uh, and it's, um, uh, uh, it deals with all developments in that previous year on oceans and the law of the sea. And it also adopts a second resolution on sustainable fisheries, uh, similarly uh, to take account of all developments relating to sustainable fisheries. It's also assisted by the work of other subsidiary bodies. Unfortunately, there's not time to get into too much of that work, but there's a very significant work that's being done by these bodies that are relevant, that's relevant to the work of the maritime industry. For example, there's the United Nations, and you may have heard of the United Nations informal consultative process, which meets every year and focuses its discussions on a specific area uh, in the oceans and law of the sea. In 2009, it met and considered its entire schedule on the issues relating to maritime safety and security. And many of the recommendations from that subsidiary body then went to the General Assembly and were adopted at the end of the year in the form of the annual resolution on oceans and law of the sea. And here's, you can see, this is just a, uh, to show you a copy of the resolution that's adopted every year, the omnibus resolution that's adopted every year by the General Assembly and some of the issues that are considered by the General Assembly every year from capacity building, uh, issues relating to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, of course, maritime safety, security, and flag state implementation, maritime, uh, marine environment, marine biodiversity, and others. The Security Council is also um, very relevant to the work that's being done by the maritime industry, and it's addressed a number of significant issues in the context of its mandate for the maintenance of international peace and security. Uh, for example, in regards to regional conflicts, the Security Council has authorized a number of naval blockades uh, to enforce sanctions. This was done in the case of Iraq, uh, the former Yugoslavia, Haiti, and Sierra Leone. In regards to piracy, the Security Council has also been very uh, heavily involved and it's opted, adopted a number of resolutions, particularly relating to piracy off the coast of Somalia. 
Um, uh, and in those resolutions, it's also authorized the um, uh, states that are patrolling off the coast of Somalia to take enforcement action within the territorial sea of Somalia. More recently, the Security Council has also been involved in the significant issue of migration by sea and the smuggling of migrants. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, it adopted a press statement on the recent uh, maritime tragedy in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so this is just to give you an overview of some of the work that's being done by the Security Council as it relates to the maritime industry. I mentioned earlier the institutions and bodies that are established under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, those are listed up here on the screen. The International Seabed Authority, which of course relate, deals with the management of the seabed resources. Um, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is involved in the cases on the interpretation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, I've mentioned, and then the meeting of the state's parties, which is the annual meeting of state's parties to the Convention on the Law of the Sea, which deals with administrative and budgetary issues, but also substantive issues, including those that relate to the maritime industry. I've mentioned the International Maritime Organization a couple of times. Um, uh, as you saw on the UN organizational chart, it's the specialized agency of the United Nations that, respons that is responsible for the safety and security of international shipping and the prevention of pollution from ships, as well as by dumping. It's also involved in legal matters, and it's, uh, it has uh, adopted a number of conventions and guidelines on liability and compensation issues, as well as the facilitation of international maritime traffic. Now, when IMO first began its operations, it was chiefly concerned with the development of international treaties relating to many of these issues uh, that are relevant to the maritime industry. And it's been so successful in doing that that um, its conventions now apply to almost 100 percent, about 98 percent of the world merchant shipping uh, tonnage uh, currently in the world. Um, so now the emphasis is very much no longer on the adoption of new instruments, but rather on the implementation of those instruments. And this is very uh, uh, importantly the work that's being done by port industries, and I'll come to that in a, in, in a minute. But uh, the work that's being done by ports is, uh, is very much at the um, cutting edge of the implementation of these instruments um, that are being developed by these UN bodies and agencies. And this is, uh, again, just to give you a, a sense of the complexity, uh, the vast uh, nature of the uh, work that's being done by the International Maritime Organization and the number of conventions and instruments that have already been adopted by the organization. Now, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea as a framework instrument uh, has a very significant um, formula or relationship with the work that's being done by the IMO and the instruments that have been adopted by the IMO. Many of the provisions in UNCLOS can only be adopted, can only be implemented through specific operative uh, regulations in other in international agreements. So in the case of maritime safety and security, uh, protection and preservation of the marine environment and the um, uh, minimizing pollution from ships, from vessels and by, uh, by, uh, by dumping, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea refers to the competent international organization, which is IMO. So states' parties to the convention are required in different cases to take account of, conform to, give effect to, or to implement relevant international rules and standards that are being developed by IMO, even though they may not be parties to those IMO instruments. This is a very particular um, uh, way in which the convention allows for the implementation uh, of, of um, uh, instruments that have been developed by IMO, IMO by parties that are not even uh, that are not even parties to those by states that are not even party to those instruments. Some of you will also be familiar with the work of the International Labor Organization. It seeks, of course, to, provide, to promote rights at work, encourage decent employment opportunities, enhance social protection, and strengthen dialogue on work-related issues for all men and women. Since 1919, the ILO has maintained and developed a system of international labor standards, and it's backed by a very unique supervisory system uh, at the international level that helps to ensure compliance and implementation of those instruments. 
The ILO has also adopted specific standards for specific industries and of course uh, in the case of the maritime industry it's in the form of the Maritime Labour Convention of 2006 which came into, um, into, uh, into force in 2013 um, and it also has very strong uh, flag state and port state inspection regimes to ensure the implementation of that, that uh, instrument. The third specialized agency of the UN to highlight is the work of the, of the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. It's the specialized agency of the UN uh, working to improve agriculture productivity and food security and to, and to better the living standards of rural populations. It's adopted a number of binding and voluntary international instruments to provide for sustainable fisheries. And the one that I'd like to highlight here is the 2009 FAO agreement on port state measures. It hasn't yet come into force. Um, it was adopted in 2009. It has currently, I believe, 16 parties to it. It will not come into force until 25 parties uh, have agreed to consent to its provisions. But it's very um, particular in the work that's, that needs to be done or that has been done by port states in that it aims to prevent illegal, illegally caught fish from entering international markets through ports. The provisions of the port state agreement provide for foreign vessels to provide advance notice and to request permission for port entry, for countries to conduct regular inspections in accordance with universal minimum standards, for offending vessels to be denied use of port or certain port services, and for information sharing networks to be created by port states. And this is just to highlight in a different way some of the other UN bodies and organizations that are involved in oceans issues. I've highlighted just a number of these. Uh, I leave it to you, of course, to, to, uh, to take a look at some of the work of these other organizations that are being done, <clears throat> that are being done that are relevant to the maritime industry. Um, but the point of this was to provide you with a sense of the uh, legal framework and the institutional framework for the work that's being done by the port industry and to highlight that it's uh, the ports are really a, po a point of intersection for many different areas of international law um, and, and they're a choking point for the integration of many of the issues that are attempting to be addressed by the international community. Um, so the work that's being done by, by ports is very uh, important to the way in which the international community is trying to address these issues either through global institutional frameworks, legal frameworks, um, uh, guidances, policy frameworks. Uh, it's very, very important for the work that's being done at the front end of the implementation of these instruments. If you're looking for more information on the work that we do, uh, the Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea, as the Secretariat of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, here's our website where you'll find uh, links to a number of different issues, as well as link to, links to other works, works that are being done by other bodies and organizations. And that's where I'll end. Thank you very much for your attention.